It is, in fact, in the life of a people or nation that the notion of self-conscious reason's actualization of beholding in the independence of the other, complete unity with it, or having for my object the free thinghood of an other which confronts me and is the negative of myself as my own being for myself, that the notion has its complete reality. Reason is present here as the fluid universal substance, as unchangeable simple thinghood, which yet bursts asunder into many completely independent beings. Just as light bursts asunder into stars, as countless self-luminous points, which in their absolute being for self are dissolved not merely implicitly in the simple independent substance, but explicitly for themselves. They are conscious of being these separate independent beings through the sacrifice of their particularity, and by having this universal substance as their soul and essence, just as this universal again is their own doing as particular individuals, or is the work that they have produced. In paragraph 350, Hegel is beginning a long, long process of clarifying for us the relationship of the particular individual, the, the self-consciousness, now understood as a moment of, of reason. All of us are, in, as individuals, reason. Uh, and that reason is also something exceeding us as well. The relation between that individuality and this universal whatever it is, the ethical life. Uh, in this case, he's going to talk about the life of a people or nation. German word for that, that Miller is translating as people or nation is folk. Um, and, and we don't want to you know, imagine too many of the negative connotations that come up with that because Hegel doesn't have that in mind. We see that as we, we go through the phenomenology. Um, what he means is any sort of community, any kind of community where there's an identity, you could say, um, there is a commonality, there's something bringing them together, they, they possess some... Um, more or less agreed upon and recognized mores or customs or, or rules. That is what, what at this point is comprising a folk, a nation. And he says that it's in um, the life of a people or nation that the notion of self-conscious reasons actualization, then he's going to tell us what that means in a moment, that it has its, its complete reality. So does that mean that we can't have relations with other people outside of our own particular community? No, not at all. As a matter of fact, part of the, the main thrust of, of Hegel's theory of history is that we actually break out of the, the confines of our own little communities into a more universal consciousness. And he thinks that the Enlightenment played a major role in, in that. Um, the Western Enlightenment, but you know, if, if Hegel were around today, he'd probably take into account Enlightenments happening in, in other cultures and what's going on present today with globalization. Um, now, all that said, um, what he is concentrating on here is the relationship between the individual and, and their particular folk, and he says, um, what's going on there? there the, the, the realization or the actualization of self-conscious reason involves beholding in the independence of the other complete unity with it. Or, in other words, having for my object the free thinghood of an other which confronts me and is the negative of myself as my own being for self. So something very dynamic is happening here within the realm of ethical life within a people it, 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 it's not just a matter of everybody knows their place and nobody ever steps out of their place. No, as a matter of fact, what we find out in most communities is that people are constantly renegotiating their, their places and, and that you know what, what happens in actuality often doesn't conform to the ideal and people talk about that and argue about that. And what's going on there? You argue with somebody else, not just to put them in their place or shut them up or push them away, but because you want some recognition of the rightness of your position at bottom. You actually want to exist in some sort of Harmony, it may not be a complete or free harmony, uh, you know, uh, but something like that. Uh, what, what the medievals often called concord, concordia, 
with other human beings. Now that's, like I said, that's you know, something to happen later on. That's an ideal that's not always realized, but it is something that is animating what happens within the life of, as he's calling it, a, a nation or a people. And now he says, here's another important transition, reason is present here as the fluid universal substance. Where have we seen this talk about fluid universal substance before? Well, think back to all the paragraphs where Hegel talked about life as a fluid universal substance. We're going to see something similar to what happened with life, understood as a universal, happening now with respect to this universal substance, which is the self-consciousness of the people or nation or what have you, the community. He says, reason is present here as this, as unchangeable simple thinghood, but it bursts asunder into many completely independent beings. And that's what we're representing here, right? Now, bursts asunder, it scatters itself. And what is the metaphor that Hegel uses here? Notice what he says. Just as light bursts asunder into, and what would you expect him to say next? As you're reading it, if, if you haven't read it before, the natural assumption, particularly given Hegel's time where in, in the natural science they were quite interested in, in making sense out of color and light. Well, you know, you set up a prism and the, the white light goes into it and it bursts into the whole rainbow, right? Hegel doesn't say that. What does Hegel say instead? The metaphor is an astral one. It has to do with the stars, with constellations. Very interesting, isn't it? The fact that he chose that metaphor instead. So he says, uh, light bursts asunder into stars as countless self-luminous points, which in their absolute being for self, in how they are for themselves, are dissolved, not merely implicitly in the simple independent substance of light, but explicitly for themselves. Where do stars for us as human beings make their most sense? I mean, we've got astronomy as a science. We can study an individual star. It's in relation to other stars. We constellate them. And we can look at a constellation as something that's you know, fixed for us. And oh, we go out and we look at the Big Dipper. Um, those of you who are in the Southern Hemisphere, you're probably not going to have the same reference points as, as I'm using here for a Northern Hemisphere audience. And so I apologize to you. I don't really know much about the, the constellations about the South. I don't even know enough about those of the North. So I'm going to use ones. You go outside and you look up at the sky and say, aha, there's the Big Dipper. And over there's the Little Dipper. And you know, you follow out the Dipper, the dipper uh, uh, spoon, and we can find the North Star, and uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we take those for granted as kind of uh, we call them fixed points. They're not really fixed points at all, as we know, in a universe where everything is expanding, and where the light that's reaching us is, in many cases, many centuries old. We are constellating them. We produce their meaning as associated with each other. We receive a lot of cues about how to do that from the society that we live in. The constellations are looked at differently in different cultures, aren't they? So we can go on and now let's use this metaphor to talk about self-consciousnesses, right? These self-consciousnesses are related to each other within the framework of a living, developing society, which is the universal substance. And he says, uh, these individual beings are conscious of being separate, independent beings through the sacrifice of their particularity. <clears throat> this is why you can never like truly be a completely independent individual. You're always doing so at the expense or really living off of, you might call it, the cultural capital of the society that has given you so much to do that. There is no such thing within the Hegelian framework as a self-made man or woman, and we're better off recognizing that to be the case, because so long as we remain caught up in this ideology, we'll never really see things fully. 
uh, or even <laughs> more partially than, than we, we do already. I mean, a better partiality. He says, um, it's through the sacrifice of our particularity that we reconnect with this universal substance. And he says, by having this universal substance as their soul and essence. Now, there's a there's also a polarity going backwards. It's not just a giving of oneself to this. Oh, take my particularity, my individuality. It's worth nothing. You have it, and I'll just be whatever you fill me up and want me to be. Oh, wonderful society. We're not just reenacting the uh, unhappy consciousness here. Hegel goes on and he says, the, individual, the universal, again, is their own doing as particular individuals, or as the work that they have produced. There is a dialectic here. There is a back and forth between the society, the community. I'm using these terms interchangeably. I know that some people like to make rigid distinctions between them. Just go with what I'm saying here. The universal, right? And the individuals and their relationships that, that, that constitute them. There's a dialectic between them. That has to be explored further. The purely particular activity and occupation of the individual refers to the needs which he has as a natural creature, that is, as a merely immediate individuality. That even these, its commonest functions, are not frustrated but enjoy an actual existence is due to the universal sustaining medium, to the might of the entire nation. But in the universal substance, the individual has this form of subsistence, not only for his activity as such, but no less also for the content of that activity. What he does is the skill and customary practice of, of all. This content, insofar as it is completely particularized, is, in its actual existence, confined within the framework of the activity of all. The labor of the individual for his own needs is just as much a satisfaction of the needs of others as of his own, and the satisfaction of his own needs he obtains only through the labor of others. As the individual in his individual work already unconsciously performs a universal work, so again he also performs the universal work as his conscious object. The whole becomes as a whole his own work for which he sacrifices himself and precisely in so doing receives back from it his own self. There is nothing here which would not be reciprocal, nothing in relation to which the independence of the individual would not in the dissolution of its being for self and the negation of itself give itself its positive significance of being for itself. This unity of being for another and making oneself a thing and of being for self, this universal substance, speaks its universal language in the customs and laws of its nation. But this existent, unchangeable essence is the expression of the very individuality which seems opposed to it. The laws proclaim what each individual is and does. The individual knows them not only as his universal objective thinghood, but equally knows himself in them or knows them as particularized in his own individuality and in each of his fellow citizens. In the universal spirit, therefore, each has only the certainty of himself, of finding in the actual world nothing but himself. He is as certain of the others as he is of himself. I perceive in all of them the fact that they know themselves to be only these independent beings, just as I am. I perceive in them the free unity with others in such wise that, just as this unity exists through me, it exists through the others too. I regard them as myself and myself in them. What is Hegel doing here in paragraph 351? It looks like he's laying out a particularly idealized and even, you might say, idyllic version of society and its relation to the individual and individuals, um, which would easily make him the target for pretty much anybody who's got a more realistic viewpoint on power relations and historical development. Now, of course, Hegel is not stupid, and, and we should always assume that. So we want to think to ourselves, what, what is really going on here? Is this something that can just be turned into a stalking horse for, say, Marxists or Foucauldians or Nietzscheans or whoever else would like to say things are never as harmonious as what we're talking about here? 
Um, or if they are, what you're talking about, Hegel, is something like a corporate fascist state, and we don't want that, that sort of thing. What, what has to be the case? Well, if we want to assume that Hegel uh, does understand that, that things are never quite so simple as that, we have to, we have to then say what is happening is um, where we're attempting to go to. This is sort of like you know, when the Marxists talk about you know, what, what society would be like after the revolution, after the proletariat takes control of the means of production. That's, this is more like it. And this is not supposed to be a working model for exactly what's going on. But what Hegel is talking about here, and of course this is also imperfect too, is how recognition, how incorporation of persons works within the framework of societies where most people do in fact exist. Not just now, but, but historically. So this is a long paragraph. Let's follow out what he's saying. Most of it is going to fit into here in this nice diagram that I've given to you, but we'll have to do a lot of uh, reconstruction along the way. He says, the purely particular activity and occupation of the individual refers to the needs which he has as a natural creature, that is, as a merely immediate individuality. So if we think back to hunter-gatherers, you, you need to go out and get something that you can eat, and probably some other raw materials that you can fashion into tools, shelter, you know, we get more complex, we have, you know, the guy who, who gets his government portion of land, and, uh, you know, the, the plow animal, and a plow, and some seed, and there you go, buddy, go homestead, or something along those lines. We have, we have all sorts of things that we might imagine uh, of this sort, and, and many individuals are, in fact, working primarily, as, as they think about it, for the purpose of their immediate satisfaction of needs, or, or that of not just them, but also their, their family, right? the little microcosm of, of society. He says, though, um, that even these, its commonest functions, are not frustrated, but enjoy an actual existence, is due to this universal sustaining medium, to the might of the entire nation. Again, remember, folk, nation, um, could be a smaller community, and here it might be useful for us to think in terms of like hunter-gatherers, right? Hunter-gatherers, we think of them as these you know, independent, reliant individuals. No, they think of themselves as belonging to a band. And what we're talking about here, the macht, the power, the might of the community, is what permits the individual to work for his or her own needs. Even if we're talking about, you know, this you know, 40 acres and a mule ideology, which unfortunately was not administered very fairly, um, there are all sorts of abuses that went on, what was able to happen happened because the person was not entirely on his or her own out there in the wilderness, but had some other people working with them and had something else besides just a bunch of other people. There was a sense of community at work. Same thing we might say with monastic communities going out into the wilderness originally to, you know, spend more time with God, but then they had to grow their own crops and build their, their stuff, and eventually they become the, the, the nuclei for entire communities that, that turn into towns. So Hegel is onto something here. There's always more going on. This almost sounds Marxian, doesn't it? There's always more going on economically and in terms of value production than meets the eye. Here's part of what's hidden in this. He goes on and he says, in the universal substance, the individual has this form of subsistence, not only for his activity as such, but no less also for the content of that activity. What he does is the skill and customary practice of all. So what I'm doing for myself, thinking about it as just for myself, is not just for myself. Or what I'm doing within the scope of my family, what I think of as just for my family, isn't just for my family. If I inculcate, for example, in my children a sense of self-reliance and responsibility for their own actions 
and you know honesty, or even if I'm just like the, the ancient Persians, as Xenophon tells us about, you know, I teach them to ride the horse, shoot the bow, and speak the truth, right? That doesn't just apply to me or the little microcosm of my family. It has wider implications. It also means if I'm a jerk and a screw-up and I mess up my family, I'm not just messing them up for me, that it's not going to just redound to myself. It's also going to affect the wider uh, society as well. If I'm a deadbeat dad, for example, and don't, don't nurture my children at all or acknowledge them. Hegel doesn't talk about that. He's talking more about the positive here, but that would have an important implication. So he goes on, and he says, this content, insofar as it's completely particularized, is, in its actual existence, confined within the framework of the activity of all, this massive economy that's going on. How does that work? He says, the labor of the individual for his own needs, so the individual works to try to get something out of it. Labor, our might, right? He works and he's supposed to be getting something out of it. But what happens? He also ends up satisfying the needs of others without perhaps even intending to. Sometimes he, he, he does. If he wants to trade some, some grain for some shoes, uh, then he's got to actually you know, farm some grain and then go find the shoemaker with his bag of grain and say, here you go, well, give me some new shoes, buddy. But that, there's an exchange taking place there, right? So he says, the labor of the individual for his own needs is just as much a satisfaction of the needs of others as of his own. And the satisfaction of his own needs he obtains only through the labor of others. Again, there is nobody who is an entirely self-made person. You know, think about Robinson Crusoe, the person, the person that people like to point towards. Now, when you read Robinson Crusoe as a book, if you want to use that as an example, Go back to those first chapters and see the inventory of stuff that he took from the ship that he didn't make himself and then used so that he could make stuff for himself. Even though he's a guy on a desert island, he's not totally cut off, at least in terms of material possessions and the knowledge of how to use them, from society. He's just locally removed, you might say from society, but he's benefiting from this universal exchange of labor, this circulation of labor that, that's going on. So he goes on, Hegel goes on, and he says, as the individual in his individual work, already unconsciously, ungewiss, without realizing it, without knowing it, performs a universal work. That's an interesting idea. The individual isn't just swapping things with some other individual. What they do has universal, not just implications, but scope, actuality. They perform a universal work. When I feed somebody, I don't just feed that person, I perform a universal work. When I go out and plow a field, I don't just turn turf, into arable land, I perform a universal work. When I save somebody's life in the ER, when I teach somebody, I perform a universal work without even realizing it, which means I better perform it well, right? Uh, in part because otherwise it's going to have greater you know, reverberations throughout the society. So he says, um, so again, he performs a universal work as his conscious object. The whole becomes, as a whole, his own work, for which he sacrifices himself, and precisely in so doing, receives back from it his own self. As the individual becomes conscious, at least dimly, of performing a universal work, there is an exchange between them and society. They receive back, as he says, he receives his, his own self back from the universal. Um, sometimes with uh, an augmentation, and quite often we, we must remark and, and acknowledge with a diminution. Um, this is precisely where somebody like a Marxist would say, aha, surplus value, aha, expropriation, you know, all these sorts of things. Yeah, that, that's true. There are a lot of people, think about peasants, for example, they're performing a, an invaluable universal work because if there's no food, 
no society for very long, right? But what they get back in return is, hey, you're a peasant. That's nice. Now, keep working, buddy. And that, that's not, they're not getting back a fair exchange quite often. A lot of this happens. We might think about, you know, the internet and how we talk about the sharing economy and people should work for exposure and all that. I mean, think about what, what you're deriving. You watch these videos. I don't, I don't actually charge for these videos because I have Patreon backers who are uh, graciously providing what you, who probably aren't a backer, are getting to watch. Right? It doesn't actually cover all of the costs of hiring a trained professional to do all this work, but let's assume that it did. Most of the internet, most of the stuff that you have available there has been produced by people who are probably not getting a hell of a lot of recognition for it or a lot of you know, remuneration. And quite a few of them have gotten, you might say, tricked, coerced, talked into doing a lot of things for free or for very cheap. Um, and, but it, it's, it's produced a universal work, right? I mean, if you go to one of the greatest, you know, uh, uh, things about this, think about the Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy, or the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. I, I don't think even the editors are getting paid. Uh, maybe they are, I don't know. But certainly the writers aren't. The writers are writing so that they can benefit the society and get some exposure and, you know, get to practice their expertise. Performing a universal work, then they get back a certain kind of recognition. We could come up with all sorts of other examples like this as well. In any case, he goes and he says, um, there is nothing here which would not be reciprocal. That's where it's getting a little bit idealistic, isn't it? Nothing which would not be reciprocal. Well, we often find things that, that aren't. But we're, we're, this is what we're aiming for. This is what we desire, according to Hegel. This is what we're trying to move towards in history. So he says, um, the, the nothing in relation to which the in independence of the individual would not, in the dissolution of its being for self and the negation of itself, give itself its positive significance of being for itself. The individual is for itself, not just in a you know, pure, reflexive relation, but mediated through not only uh, another individual, but society. So he goes on and he says, this unity of being for self, or making oneself a thing, and a being for self, this universal substance, here's where we get the second part of the thing up here, speaks a universal language in the customs and laws, the, the zitte and the gazettes, gazette, of the nation, of, of the, the group. Notice at this point, Hegel is not just talking about customs. He's talking about something that's actually formulated and uh, in some way more consolidated. And that's not necessarily written down, but something that is more um, official. Gazette, uh, you know, something that's been established. It has been, you know, Zetsen is to set. You know, Gazette is what has been set down. So he says that's a, a universal language. This is a really interesting point. Actually, I, when I read this, I wanted to dwell on this a bit in the commentary. So we think of language sometimes as having its own laws or as being a customary kind of thing. And yes, that, that's all true. But we think of language as sort of a syntax and a vocabulary connected with a certain semantics and pragmatics and all this, this sort of stuff. We can use language as a nice tool and medium to do the things that we want to do. What's that communication, et cetera, et cetera, right? And then we have the moral sphere over here with customs. You should do things this way. This is the way we do things around here. People say this, they don't say that. And then we have laws. Do this or we're going to punish you. This is what you have to do, right? They fuse together. No language is without value judgments built into it. Even languages where people are trying to change that. You know, we're going to change the vocabulary so that we liberate everybody from a uh, vocabulary that's so oppressive. Oh, you just create another new oppressive vocabulary. This is why South Park is such a successful TV show, because they, they have their finger on that sort of thing. Uh, and we can talk about other lampooning of, 
of that sort of stuff as well. You can euphemize all you like. There's always going to be some value judgments built in. So the key is not to not have value judgments. It's to try to make sure that they're the right value judgments. And how do you talk about that? Well, you have to use a language that itself is imbued with value judgments. Hegel has some very interesting stuff to say here at this point. He says, um, this existent, unchangeable essence is the expression of the very individuality which seems opposed to it. The laws proclaim what? What each individual does and also what each individual is. So in receiving its own self back from the universal, <clears throat> it's not just you know, getting back its own labor or something like that. It's also getting back its identity. <clears throat> we have our identity largely provided to us by the social fabric within which we live within which recognition can take place. So he goes on and he says, the individual knows them not only as his universal objective thinghood, objectified, right, but equally knows himself in them, or knows them as particularized in his own individuality, and in that of his fellow citizens, Mitburg, people who live within, literally, the same municipality, the same community. So he says, in the universal spirit, each has only the certainty of himself, of finding in the actual world nothing but himself. He is as certain of the others as he is of himself. I perceive in all of them the fact that they know themselves to be only these independent beings, just as I am. <clears throat> I perceive in them the free unity with others in such wise that just as this unity exists through me, so it exists through the others too. I regard them as myself and myself as them. Again, I, I've already said many times, this is a bit idealistic. But this is what we're driving towards. Spirit works. Spirit exists. Spirit develops through this sort of interaction that Hegel is sketching out here. Recognition occurs through this as one of the essential activities, or you might say, eventual products and goals of spirit. <clears throat>